your Bibles want to follow along, we're going to look at Philip's story today, Acts chapter 8. I like his hair, it's cool. <laughs> but Acts chapter 8. You know, uh, next week actually we're, we're wrapping up our AD series. And uh, hopefully you've been encouraged and been inspired as we've gone through the series. Uh, next week we're going to wrap that up. The week after we're going to do a special service. You want to make sure that you're here for that. We're going to have special music and everything else. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy that. And then in July we've got three or so missionaries that are coming in and going to share some exciting things about what God's doing. So we're, we're going to wrap up our series next week. But, you know, as we've been looking through the book of Acts, really what it is, is it's, it's a recording of the birth of the early church. And what we know about Jesus is before he ascended to heaven, he gathered his disciples together one last time, and he gave them a final command. He gave them what we call the Great Commission, the Great Commandment, just, a, just a, a way for Jesus to come together with his disciples one last time and remind them what the mission was, what the goal was all about. And we see that in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Jesus tells his disciples, he said, you'll be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. I think we're having some tech problems. We should have that on the screen. Is it working, guys? There we go. All right. Now, I want you to see this word, everywhere, and where? Jerusalem. All right, let's try it one more time. Where? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Okay, I want you to remember this for a reason. So tell people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and then he says, to the ends of the earth. Now, let's talk about Jerusalem for a minute, because a lot of the... The recordings and acts are centered around what's happening in Jerusalem. And if you remember, miracles are taking place. Incredible things are happening in Jerusalem. The gospel was spreading. It was going forth with power. Lives were being changed. Miracles were taking place. We could say that God was moving in a big time way. And the church was growing. It was exploding. Things were happening. But at the same time, there was a problem. And let me just say, it's a problem that you and I struggle with today. We could say it this way, it's a people problem. And the problem was this, that people don't like change. Another way of saying that is folks like the familiar. They, they like to be comfortable. They don't really like to be challenged. They're all about ease. And so understand that the church was struggling to go outside of Jerusalem. Jesus said, yes, reach Jerusalem. But then he also said, Judea and Samaria and everywhere you go. So the church was, in a sense, stuck. They were struggling. And like God, his plans never change. Did you know that about God? His plans never change. And so just like he told his disciples in Acts 1-8, you're going to be my witnesses... God said, you know what? You're going to be my witnesses. And so you know what happens? Persecution comes. Acts chapter 8, verse number 1. This is when Stephen was stoned, was martyred, killed for his faith. Here's what scripture says. A great wave. I love that wording. It's a great description. A great wave of persecution began that day. Notice this now. Sweeping over the church, where? In Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Now check this out. And all the believers except the apostles were scattered, are you following me? Through the regions of where? And where else? What was the Great Commission all about? Go everywhere. And so God said, you know what, I, I understand you, you've got a problem. You don't like change. You like the familiar. So let me turn the heat up a little bit because my mission hasn't changed. Understand this about God. God is not sitting up there in heaven in his spiritual couch. Just laying down. Just watching the world go by. Are you with me? Our God is an active God. He's not passive. He's working. He's moving. Day and night, 24-7, he never sleeps or slumbers, the Bible says. God is always moving and always working. Now, here's the deal. 
We are created in the image of God. And so you know what that means? God's looking for people and he's looking for a church who's willing to make a difference. God's looking for people who are willing to impact the world. God's looking for people who will do one thing. Go. That's God. God's about go. He's moving. He's working. And so this morning, we're going to look at a guy, we already said, Philip, who really made an impact for God, who, whose life really made a difference. And it was because he was willing to do one thing, really, and it was go. And I want you to see his story. Acts 8, verse 26. Here's what the scripture says. We saw some of this on, on the video clip. But it says this, As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, Go south down to the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. And he met the treasure of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under the candidate, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, Go over and walk beside the carriage. I love these. So Philip, what did he do? Yeah, we'll come back to that. He didn't walk. He ran. He ran over and heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. Philip asked him, Do you understand what you're reading? And the man replied, How can I unless somebody instructs me? And he urged Philip to come into the carriage and sit with him. The passage of scripture he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. He was humiliated and received no justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? So beginning with the same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look. I, I can just sense his excitement. They're in the desert, first of all. How many of you know when you find water, it's kind of a miracle? But he's like, look, my goodness, there's water. Why can't I be baptized? So he ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down in the water, and Philip baptized him. And I love this because it reminds me of Star Trek for some reason. <laughs> but when they came up out of the water... The spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. Meanwhile, Philip found himself further north at the town of Azotus. He preached the good news there, and in every town along the way until he came to Caesarea. Now, that's an incredible story, and I know what you're thinking, and I agree with you. Odds are you're not going to leave church today and run into a eunuch. And you're not going to share the gospel with them and to be snatched away like beam me up Scotty. Okay? That's probably not going to happen. I agree with you there. But yet, when you look at Philip's story, there are some things that we need to be aware of. There, there's some things that we need to put into our life if we're really going to make a difference and make an impact for God. You know, I, I would say it this way. God doesn't want us to just take up space. He wants our lives to be effective. He wants our lives to make an impact. So how do we do that? Well, I think what you see from Philip's life is, is something that we need to do. Philip was willing to go. He was willing to go. And I think the question for each and every one of us this morning is this. Am I willing to go? Am I willing to go? Get this. Philip, he was willing to trust God. He was willing to obey God. He was willing to follow God. And as I thought about how Philip was willing to go, this, this phrase kind of kept popping in my mind, and I started thinking about how Philip made a mark and how God wants our lives to, to make an impact, or we could say he wants our lives to make a mark. And maybe I'm running out of material, I don't know, but I started thinking about my daughter Lila. She's five years old. And I started just thinking about how she's great at making a mark. 
I mean, she really is. You know, I, I look at the windows <laughs> at my house, and there's little fingerprints and smudges on the window. She, she makes marks. I see the, the hallways and the walls, and I see footprints on there. And I'm thinking, how in the world? I mean, how are footprints on the walls? And then there's toys. You know how that goes, parents, right? There's toys all over the place, and then you step on them, and they hurt. And you're like, Lord, help me not to lose my salvation. That hurts. <laughs> right? And, and then I think about how she's in a room sometimes just playing by herself, and then I hear her singing. And then if you know my daughter, she talks nonstop. And she does it at home, too. I mean, one day she was playing with Play-Doh, and she just kept talking and talking and talking. And finally, Lisa or I said, okay, Lila, we just need like five minutes of silence. And then I look at our refrigerator, and there's projects and pictures and everything all over the refrigerator. And then I go to my office, and there's little notes. And there's little pictures in my office, and then she takes things and moves things around in my office. Now, don't misunderstand me. I love it. I wouldn't want it any other way. But I started thinking, how is she, at five years old, able to make a mark? How is she able to do those things? And the thought crossed my mind that the reason she can make a mark is because she doesn't sit still. Come on, I'm preaching now. She doesn't sit still. She is active. She is always on the go. And God is looking for people just like that. Who are saying, Lord, I'll follow you anywhere. Whatever you ask me to do, I will do it. Because I want my life to matter. I want my life to leave a mark. I want to make a difference for you. And hear me, the only way you can do that is by being willing to go. And that's the kind of people God's looking for. That's the kind of people that God will empower and that God will use. Now hear me though, because anytime we decide to make a mark, anytime we have this desire in our life to move forward, to trust God and follow God, you know what happens? There, there are some roadblocks that pop up along the way. You ever experienced that? Some things that, that just pop up and they try to hold us back and they try to keep us from moving forward. Just quickly, let me remind you of some roadblocks that we've got to push through. And, and I'm sure because Philip was, was a guy, a person just like you and me, he probably had to fight through some of these things. But I do know these roadblocks, they're common to each and every one of us. They're something that we are all struggle with if we're really real and honest. And, and the first roadblock we have to push through is our past. Because I'll tell you, when you decide to say yes to God and to follow God, your past pops up. Did you ever notice that? And the enemy begins to say, you know what? You've got a pretty colorful past. God can't use you. God, God can't use you. He brings our past up to condemn us, to make us feel guilty, to try to discourage us and, and overwhelm us. And a lot of times we miss out on, on making a mark with our life because we let our past Hold us back. Let me say this. Every one of us, we have this in common. We have a past. But if you want to make a difference with your life, here's what you need to do. When the enemy comes at you and begins to remind you of yesterday and how you used to be and, and how your life used to struggle and all those things that just came against you, when he reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. Amen. And you move forward. And you follow God. And you go. You know what else we come up against? It's common to us. Is that when God says go, we always feel unprepared. We look at our life and say, oh, little old me? I mean, really, God? Talk about your rocker. Have you fallen off your rocker? I mean, not only do I have a past, but, you know, I'm, I'm really not qualified. I don't have everything together in my life. I've still got issues and struggles. I'm not perfect. I don't have all this knowledge or understanding. I'm just unprepared. I, you can't use me. I can't go. And let me put you at ease today. Because when you feel unprepared, guess what? That's good. Because you'll always feel unprepared. 
Whenever God tells you to go, whenever he gives you an assignment, whenever there's an opportunity in front of you to make a mark with your life, you'll feel unprepared. Use that to draw strength from the Lord. Use that to let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you. But you'll always feel unprepared. I came here two years ago and I thought, oh Lord. And when I go to my office tomorrow and begin to pray, I will say the same thing, oh Lord. Because you always feel unprepared. But God says, go anyway. You know what else we, we have to fight and push through? And I think this is where a lot of us fall short at personally, is not understanding God's plan. See, because we're people, we like to have the big picture before we move forward. Now, here's what we just have to remember about Philip. We touched on it briefly, but Philip was in Samaria. And a revival was taking place in Samaria. You realize that? I mean, you can look at it yourself later on. Acts chapter 8. The Bible says signs and wonders and amazing things were happening in Samaria. People were getting saved. Their lives were being changed. People were being healed. People were being baptized. And then God says to Philip, I want you to leave Samaria and go to the middle of nowhere. Don't you love that? Talk about not understanding. Because wasn't things happening in Samaria? Well, God, I mean, there's a revival here. I don't want to miss out on this. This is great. And God says, yeah, I got Samaria covered. Now you need to go to the desert. And, and I began to think about not understanding God. And, and really, Scripture has a lot to say about this. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 5. Solomon, the wisest person who ever lived, listen to the words he writes. He says, just as you cannot understand the path of the wind, and we know that for a fact, right? Because like 6 o'clock tonight, the weatherman's going to come on and say, stuff's going to come from the south and everything else. You can laugh, it's okay. <laughs> I would love that job, by the way, wouldn't you? You get paid for being wrong. I mean, how awesome is that? But you can't understand the path of the wind or the mystery of a tiny baby grown in his mother, mother's womb. Here it is. So, you cannot understand the activity of God. Woo! Who does all things. You can't understand God. I can't figure Him out. Neither can you. Just the moment you think you've got... God figured out, you realize he's so much bigger and greater and your mind is blown all over again. That's why the Bible says his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And what is so sad is that a lot of people miss out on God because they want to understand him. You'll never understand God. And if you wait to understand God, You'll be sitting there until he comes back. Because God's moving. God's working. And he's looking for people who will what? Go. Now here's the thing about God though. Since we don't understand him and we can't, what do you do? Well, you follow him one step at a time. And scripture talks about our steps. You realize that, right? Psalm 37 tells us the Lord directs the steps of the godly. Amen. He delights in every detail of their lives. That's good news. And then Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to guide my what? Amen. My feet. And it's a light for my path. And Psalm 119 is a beautiful word picture because it's talking about ancient travelers who would travel at night. And you know, they didn't have the technology we do today, like the million candle watt, whatever, that just makes it look like daylight outside. They didn't have that. They had little old oil lamps that you could barely see right in front of you. And, and as they're walking along a path at night, they're swinging this oil lantern from side to side, holding it out in front of them because they want to try to see danger. 
But they want to avoid the rocks. They want to avoid the ruts. They don't want to stumble and fall. They want to move forward. They want to go. And then other travelers, they would attach these little oil lamps to their feet, to their ankles. And so get this. It was literally lighting your path or your step one step at a time. Let me tell you something about God. You know this from experience. But let me remind you. God only promises enough light for the next step. Get the step in. You're not going to figure it all out. You're not going to understand Him. The only thing you and I can do is say, God, I'm going to take my next step. And trust you'll meet me there. And trust you'll be faithful there. You can't understand God. And you know what else we do? Another roadblock, and I don't need to spend a lot of time here, but we don't like pain. And so oftentimes, we avoid pain at any cost. And here's the deal. If you want to follow Jesus, though, if you want to make a mark, it's going to cost you. You can't escape that. There's no such thing as a comfortable Christianity, guys. There's no such thing as following Jesus and life is easy. Life is hard. Amen. And it hurts. Amen. And following Jesus will cost you something. And hear me today. Following Jesus is not safe. If you want to be safe, then don't follow Jesus. Because it's going to cost you. And it's going to be painful. And we don't like that. But they are roadblocks that we have to push through if we want our life to make a difference. See, God's looking for people who are willing to go. So enough about the roadblocks. Let's get back to Philip, all right? His story. He was willing to go, but also Philip was this. He was available to God. Are you available to God? And what you see about a story, it's remarkable, it's subtle, but Philip was available to anyone at any time and in any place. Oh, that's the kind of people God's looking for. That when you go to the grocery store, you're available. See, what we do too many times as Christians is we come to church and we flip on our Christian switch. Oh, come on now. And we're all Christian. Like, bless you. I'm praying for you. I love you. God is good. God is awesome. But then Monday morning, you flip off the Christian switch. Oh, come on. We're people. And all you're thinking about is, I just need to make it through the day. And if I can just get home safe and sound at night, that's an accomplishment. Don't let anybody bother me. Don't let anybody mess up my routine. I, I just have to be about me. Right? Are you available? Am I available? Anyone, anytime, any place. And you know what else my, my, my heart's full this morning? Because we have folks here in this church who do that. They're available. I, I, I talked to, I'm going to tell on her, but I talked to Mary last week in the lobby, and she was just so excited. She just couldn't wait to tell me about how God used her and what happened in her life. She, she went, I, I believe if I got the story straight, she went out of town to buy some flowers. And while she was there, she, she ran into this guy. I don't know if he worked there or if it was just a random guy. But they began to talk and have this conversation. And only like the Spirit of God can do, it begins to turn to faith. And right there in the flower garden, she begins to share her faith and share Jesus with this guy. And right there, he accepts Jesus into his life. She gives him a track and says, you know what? You need this because you need to understand the decision you just made. And then she encouraged him to get involved in a Bible-believing church. That's availability. And let me tell you something. God's not looking for ability. See, we put too much stock in that. God doesn't care about what you can do. He knows what you can do because He made you to do it. What He cares about is availability. Are you available? Am I available? Amen. To anyone, at any time, and in any place. 
Oh, I know it's heavy. But you know, if you want to make a mark and make a difference with your life, you've got to be available. There's no other way. No other way. And Philip did that. And you know the last thing we see about Philip? He had a sense of urgency. Because when the Holy Spirit spoke to Philip and said, I want you to walk over to this man, the Bible says he ran. He didn't walk. He ran. That communicates a sense of urgency, does it not? And that's the kind of life and urgency that you and I need to have. It's the kind of urgency that, that Lisa and I experienced at O'Hare Airport. You know, when we came here two years ago to interview, we were flying back to South Carolina. We got into O'Hare Airport way ahead of schedule. I mean, we're, we're feeling good about this. You know, we're going to have a little bit of time to maybe eat or just relax. We're not going to have to run. Now, I, I don't know why O'Hare Airport's so screwed up, but it really is. You guys know that from experience, right? Just call it what it is. So we get there way ahead of time, and go figure, they didn't have a gate for us to go to. So we're sitting out there in an airplane with all these people for two hours. Talk about fun. And we had to catch a connecting flight to Atlanta. You know, hot Atlanta, right? We had to get there. The plane for Atlanta was about to leave when we finally made it to our gate. So you know what we had to do? We had to walk. Uh, it's like, we, we can do this tomorrow. Just walk. You know we didn't do that, right? You know what I was saying? There's no way I'm spending the night in this airport. <laughs> and I also said this. I don't care if I look like a fool. I don't care if I, if I just look all awkward and weird because we had some bags. I said, honey, we better run. <laughs> just run. And it was the picture of Home Alone. They're running through the airport. That's what we were doing. Because you know, your gate's never next door. It's always like at the other side of the airport. So we're, we're booking, we're running. We, we couldn't just walk. Can I tell you that's the kind of life God's looking for? No? When it comes to serving Him? Somebody that says, Lord, I've got a sense of urgency. You've heard this before, but 84,161 people in Winnebago County do not claim any church. We got some work to do. Talk to this side. We got work to do. And we have to be urgent about it. Understand. Get this. Our time on earth is short. Eternity is for real. Jesus is coming back, is he not? And get this, there are no sinners in heaven. We better be urgent. We better be deliberate. We better be intentional. And so some of you might be thinking, well, why are you bringing in kids, pastors? Because we're urgent. Because we've got families around here that need to know about Jesus. We have children that are going to schools and being bullied, and they don't know who they are. And they need to know there's a God in heaven who loves them, and who has good plans for their life, and who can change them and help them. We're urgent, guys. We're urgent. And it's time for you and me to have that sense of urgency. So as John comes and we just spend a moment reflecting on what we've heard. We've got some questions to answer. Am I willing to go? Are you willing to go? Now, sometimes we make too big a deal out of the word go. That's going to look different for each and every one of us. But make no mistake, it's all about the go. You see, for some of you, you need to go into your family and be a light. For some of you, you need to go to your workplace tomorrow 
And that person that God's been putting on your heart to kind of share faith with them, you need to start up a conversation. For others to go, maybe you've got to go next door to your neighbor and love them and care for them. And let them know there's a God in heaven who loves them and who can help them live the best life possible through Jesus. You need to go. You know, for, for others, God's put gifts in your life and you're just sitting. And God's saying your go is you need to go to the welcome desk and say, I want to get plugged into ministry here. I can do something. You know, my heart's so full because I look at Richard here. And some of you don't know this. They live out by uh, Wyweega, out there by Spencer Lake. They drive in here like 30 or 40 minutes to come to church, and he was up there playing the drums. See, I love that. My heart's full because there are people that say, Lord, I'll go, I'll do it, I'll serve, I can do something. That may be your go. For others, your go may be there's a missionary that God wants you to support. And as hard as it is, you need to write that check. You need to send it to him. For others, your go may, you need to grow in your faith. You just feel a little dried up. You feel a little just stuck and stagnant. And God's saying you need to keep moving, keep going, keep growing. Are you willing to go? And then is your life available? Anytime, any moment, any place, are you available? And then lastly, it really all comes down to this. Are you willing to take a step? Are you willing to move? You know the journey of a thousand miles? It begins with a single Are we going to be a church? I know it's not proper grammar. Are we going to be a church that gets to step in? Are we going to live a life where we're willing to go? See, if we're going to make a mark, make a difference, make an impact, we've got to go. We've got to go. Stand this morning. worship the Lord for a moment. Let's just allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and our lives. And we'll pray. Let's just wait on God for a moment.